Hello, this is Garrett Choby, and today we'll be discussing a case of an esthesioneuroblastoma treated with an endoscopic cranial face resection and nasal septal flap repair. This is a case with myself and my neurosurgical partner, Dr. Jamie Van Gumpel. This is a gentleman with a uh, Kadish C Himes grade 2 esthesioneuroblastoma. As you can see in this imaging, there is a bit of the tumor that goes through the skull base intracranially, as well as some enhancement of the dura over top of the left orbital apex. Here we are examining the patient's nasal cavity, taking a few frozen section biopsies at the beginning of the case. Although we had a diagnosis ahead of time, I always like to get a frozen at the beginning just to confirm diagnosis and uh, preclude any surprises later on. We're in the right nasal cavity now, resecting the right middle turbidant, as you can see here. This is going to gain us some access to the back of the nose, as well as allow us to examine the tumor in the back of this right side. We are cauterizing the stump of the middle turbinate here with a uh, bipolar cautery. I prefer a bipolar cautery in this case to not spray any cautery onto the uh, SPA or posterior septal branch for a potential flap. Now in this case, the tumor is more involved in the left than the right side, but there is some tumor here involving the right nasal septum. So as we begin to delineate a potential flap for reconstruction, we will make incisions with a needle tip bovi just below the flap, leaving a fairly narrow margin. And then you'll see in a little bit here, we'll begin to raise this and then take margins from the flap. This will ensure us that there's not tumor contamination in the reconstruction at the end of the case. Reconstruction is of course very important for all these cases, but the most important thing is an oncologic resection with negative margins. So never uh, compromise your oncologic resection just for a potential reconstructive option. After that, we'll go ahead and do our sinus work here on the right side. This tumor uh, fairly well respects the middle turbinates and does not go very far laterally. So we've completed a maxillary antrostomy and total ethmonectomy on the right side. Now here we are elevating that tumor up over the coenal arch and then begin to take some tumor out at uh, the base of the sphenoid sinus there and over the coenal arch. Now here we are opening into the right sphenoid sinus. As is typical, there's a fair bit of insipated secretions within that sinus. And here we are extending that a little bit towards the left side here and to the back of the nasal septum. Those margins did in fact come back negative. So here we are now uh, delineating the incisions for our nasal septal flap uh, well around the tumor and then carrying that anteriorly high in the nasal vault to the mucocutaneous junction. In this case, we'll raise an extended flap onto the floor of the nasal cavity. Now, the pedicle for this on the quinal arch is narrower than ideal, but that being said, we thought we could still encapsulate some good vascularity and have a reasonable uh, flap for the end of the case. Once these connect anteriorly, we'll begin to raise this uh, in a submucoperiosteal fashion here with a caudal elevator. When you raise an extended flap, the typical challenging area is in the incisive foramen at the junction of the septum and the nasal floor, just around that area there. We'll transect that and then buzz that artery there with cautery, and then raise this off the nasal floor in the septum, and then place it into the right nasopharynx for safekeeping. Although the mucosa in the sphenoid appeared to be clear, we went ahead and took some margins from the sphenoid sinus, as you can see here, to get a sort of a posterior margin in that area, and we'll work around this uh, tumor circumferentially. Now here we are turning our attention to the patient's left side. As I mentioned earlier, the tumor is a bit more involving the left than the right. We don't need a flap on this side, so we make a bit of a wider incision on the nasal septum around the tumor. And then again, we will sample margins from uh, the nasal septum side of this to ensure that we're clear. This also gives us our inferior aspect for our cranial base resection as we take these margins out and then can eventually take out the whole back of the nasal septum. Here we're taking that uh, superior portion of the margins here on the patient left side, again on the nasal septum up towards the uh, anterior cranial fossa. And then of course for a cranial base resection, we'll remove the left middle turbinate as well. This was involved with tumor, but again, it fairly well respected the middle turbinate and it did not extend far laterally much into the ethmoid region. Completing a left-sided maxillary entrostomy here, and then again a total ethmoidectomy, and you can see that uh, normal looking healthy mucosa here. Now here we are working on the septum itself to complete uh, a near complete posterior septectomy, taking out the bone and cartilage down to the floor of the nose uh, to gain access for our cranial base resection. When possible, of course, we'll leave the anterior septum for support of the nose. The last bit of the keel of the rostrum is being removed there. Now here we are turning our attention towards the frontal sinus once that septum has been removed. 
In these cases, of course, for an anterior cranial base resection, we will require a draft three frontal sinusotomy. This allows full access to the frontal sinus and allows a nice anterior osteotomy for access to the crystagalli. Once the frontals are open, we will then make an anterior superior septectomy, as you can see here, and then open up towards the, the frontal sinus here on the right side. We'll then come across through the septum here and gain that bilateral access. Usually the bit of bleeding here is requires some cauterization. And then we'll begin to drill across uh, from the patient left side towards the patient right side here with a high-speed drill, completing our horseshoe-shaped draft three to gain that access again to the most anterior aspect, the crystagalli and the anterior cranial fossa. Some of the bone will be quite thick here along the frontal beak, and a high-speed drill is going to be your friend to come across there, and occasionally switching to hand instruments like this hoseman punch as well for some of the soft tissue work. Now you're seeing that nice uh, horseshoe-shaped cavity through the patient's right nostril bilaterally. Typically what I'll do in this situation is we'll then uh, debulk some of the tumor here uh, as my neurosurgical partners get ready to come into the field to complete their osteotomies. We'll just debulk some of that to get a little bit easier access for them and a wide exposure bilaterally. Although the mucosa appears normally in the ethmoid cavity along the orbits, we will go ahead and obtain some sampling margins there as well to be definitive, and these were uh, negative for tumor. Now we'll just debulk the central tumor here along the uh, middle term attachment points in the uh, olfactory cleft, clearing this just to get a little better access to the bilateral cranial base. Once that's done, uh, my neurosurgical partners will come into the field here, and you'll see some beginning uh, drilling here along the crystal galley, and a bit laterally as well. The key aspects here for the cranial base resection is to drill and free up the crystagalli centrally. This generally needs to be drilled down and come out in a few pieces by lifting the dural leaflets around it on either side. Here we are now exposing the bone anteriorly and again drilling down that thickened crystagalli in this particular case. These are micro true cuts which are especially helpful here along the thickened area of uh, dura and around the olfactory fila. Here's just now better exposing uh, the bone over the crystagalli, taking down that, a little bit more posterior dura just behind it there, and exposing that uh, bone more definitively. Now here's that larger piece of crystagalli coming out, uh, and this really allows this uh, bone to be removed and a bit more soft tissue access there. Now we're drilling uh, laterally on the patient's left and right sides here, uh, coming across, of course, uh, soon the anterior ethmoid artery on both sides, which need to be exposed, and then bipolar cauterate, and then later on you'll see in the posterior ethmoid arteries as well. The bone's being removed here, exposing the dura uh, underlying it, as you can see here, working a bit more posterior on the left side, exposing that dura. The fovea ethmoidalis and uh, ethmoid skull base here being removed, and as you can see very nicely here, uh, the uh, posterior ethmoid artery being uh, bipolar there on the patient right side. Once those arteries are cauterized, you can come across them a bit more easily. Here taking out the um, mucosa and the sphenoid sinus, as you can see here, there was some microscopic disease there in the upper portion, which was removed and then lower down was uh, sampled and that was negative. They're drilling some on the planum, and then uh, the left posterior ethmoid artery being cauterized, and then uh, come across sharply with scissors. Here's the right optical carotid recess mucosa being removed, uh, which was uh, free from tumor. And now that the dura has been exposed 360 degrees around the defect, this can now be incised with a extendable knife. And our dural incisions are being carried out here with a feather blade. Now that the crystal has been removed, the dura here is more easily accessible and can be come across. And then again, our micro true cuts here coming across anteriorly with that thickened dura. A little extra cautery there on the anterior ethmoid artery, then continuing to dissect dura here uh, on the patient right side. As we continue to resect this uh, central skull base, circumferentially will of course get margins around the dura as well as we work around these areas uh, anteriorly, posteriorly, and laterally. 
Of course, there is some standard microscopic dissection techniques here along the brain, and as you'll see soon, the olfactory uh, bulbs and tracks. The challenging part here is oftentimes getting it free from the falks. This requires some cautery and then coming through with sharp scissors to get that uh, falks incision and margin. Now peeling uh, the olfactory tracks here posteriorly along with the dura with the cranial base resection. Coming around laterally here on the patient's right side as you can see with sharp scissors and dissection. And then similarly here on the left side as well. And again, we'll simultaneously obtain margins further lateral to this as we work back. Now here we are further back uh, near the proximal portion of the olfactory tracts, which we'll come across sharply here, and then take sample for margins as well in the proximal portion. This is a really key area, of course, for olfactory neuroblastoma, as there can be spread of tumor along these olfactory tracts, uh, posteriorly over top of the planum, so obtaining good uh, proximal margins on the olfactory tract is uh, very important. Now finishing the dura cuts here posteriorly over the planum, and then of course sampling the dura over the planum to ensure we're far back enough on this side. As I showed earlier, there was some uh, dural enhancement over top of the left orbital apex, but in this case, uh, the margin there was clear. We did not need to proceed further there along the left orbital apex. There's that final specimen coming out there. And uh, next, getting those additional margins there on the posterior uh, left side. There's our planum margin of dura coming out now. And this was clear for additional tumor as well. Here we are now assessing uh, the defect and thinking about our reconstruction. Uh, typically, we'll do a uh, duragen inlay followed by a fascia lata uh, inlay as well. In this case, we had a relatively limited size uh, defect, so we actually elected for a, an alloderm inlay as opposed to fascia lata. Pulling up the nasal septal flap here and just sort of measuring it and seeing how well it fits in the defect, as you can see here, seems to have good uh, reach and good stretch there, which we think is a reasonable reconstruction. Now here is the final defect, uh, the entire cranial base resected here from orbit to orbit, and uh, the anterior cranial fossa down to the planum. Here is duragen now being placed as an inlay, so deep to the dura, right along the brain. And you can see a nice uh, two-handed technique tucking that in around the dura all the way around. And now here's our alloderm coming in as a second layer inlay. Although we oftentimes do use fascia lata, we can occasionally see complications. And for a smaller defect like this, we thought alloderm might be a nice way to get uh, this tucked in around there. We have a little bit of a, a slot there cut for tucking it along the falks and over top of the, po the anterior table, the frontal sinus. Now tucking this in posteriorly over top of the planum as well, as you can see here with a very nice tight uh, inlay reconstruction, carefully ensuring there's no uh, furrowed edges or otherwise uh, areas that could let CSF seep around it. And now we'll go ahead and get our nasal septal flap and uh, really pull that up anteriorly. As you can see, it can reach the whole way into the posterior table of the frontal sinus. That extended portion is very nice to cover over the defect from orbit to orbit. And here we are stretching it out, just unfurling all the edges and ensuring we have nice contact uh, all the way around for this flap. As I mentioned earlier, this was a bit of a narrower pedicle due to the tumor involvement, but here we have a nice ICG run, demonstrating some really nice vascularity of the flap the whole way up to the end of it. And now here we'll place some Certicel uh, as a sort of picture frame around the edges. We'll then tuck in some gel foam uh, to get a nice apposition along the skull base there towards the planum. You can see some nice pulsatility there as well. And finally, we'll do some additional packing with uh, dural sealant. Now here we are with a post-operative MRI scan about one month after surgery, demonstrating an excellent resection. The first key point when treating esthesio neuroblastoma is just like all sinus malignancies, oncologic principles take precedence. So obtaining a negative margin resection is of utmost importance. This can be achieved both endonasally or via combined open approaches. Whatever the tumor dictates for that particular case is what's most important for obtaining a negative margin resection. The second key point is planning your reconstruction. If you are electing to proceed purely endonasally, you must be assured you have enough material left to reconstruct the skull base defect at the end. This may include inlays as well as potentially uh, onlay mucosa when available. Lastly, multidisciplinary team approaches for sinus malignancies are of utmost importance. This includes a variety of services that are critically uh, important for these cases, including neurosurgery, otolaryngology, and then of course post-operative care with adjuvant radiation therapy and chemotherapy when needed.